We're going to start lesson number 18 tonight. And before we start, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give thanks for your presence tonight. We ask that you lead us and guide us and direct us into that portion of your word that will be of great benefit. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Lord, someone is going to be listening or watching this lesson and this message tonight. And I pray that it would touch their heart. Lord Jesus, we're not, we're not trying to make theologians out of people. We're trying to teach them the basic word of God. Lead us and guide us into the simplicity of your word tonight. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. Please be seated. Last week, or in the last lesson, excuse me, we, we went through a pretty detailed account of what happens when a man dies. What, what is death all about? In, in Lesson 17, we learned that all men die. There's no exceptions. The rich, the poor, every race, every nationality, everybody, sooner or later, is going to die. We also found out that there were two types of death. And one is physical death. And we went into detail on physical death. The other one is spiritual death. Spiritual death is just as devastating as physical death. And then we found out that there were two types of people that die. And that's saved people and unsaved people. That's the only two kinds of people that die. Saved and unsaved. And then we studied about the fact that the Lord is not going to judge us by our family by our political affiliation, our social standing, our financial standing, our racial standing, or our national status. He's going to judge every one of us and, and by us as individuals. Did you know that God does not have one single grandchild? All he has is children. Amen. And... Uh, Everybody is going to be an individual in the sight of God. And then we learn what happens at the rapture, and we learn what happens uh, at the white throne of judgment. Now, tonight, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a detail. Uh, and uh, again, I'm not trying to make theologians out of us. And uh, when I got to putting this lesson together, I, I found out that if I did a third job, that I would have to do 12 lessons just on judgment alone. And since time will not allow, uh, I'm only going to do one lesson on judgment, and I'm going to cover the basics of judgment. And uh, in this lesson, we're going to study about the day of judgment. And the first thing that I want to establish here tonight is the fact of judgment. Amen. Open your Bible, and let's do a little studying. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and verse 28. And we used this verse also last week, and we're going to use it again, or excuse me, last lesson. We're going to use it again in this lesson. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, after death, there is coming judgment. Amen. Now, we all understand judgment. That's why we have courthouses. We know that when the judge sits on that bench... The authority of the Constitution of the United States of America is behind him. And when he pronounces judgment, no one can change that judgment without an appeal process. And then it simply goes to a higher judge or a higher panel of judges. And finally, it goes to the Supreme Court. In this case, the Almighty God is the Supreme Court. His judgment is always final. We're going to find out why here in just a moment. And so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Praise God. Now, in the last lesson, we studied death, and in this lesson, it is obvious that death, excuse me, that, that judgment must always follow death. Now, turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 12, and let's do a little studying of the Scripture. Matthew 12 and verse number 31, 
Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. The Lord, let me tell you this now, it's very important that you understand that there is only one sin that God will not forgive. He will forgive all manner of blasphemy and sin. The only sin that God will not forgive is when you start contributing the works of God to the devil. That's called blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And of course, how can anybody be saved when they're in the process of actually cursing God? But there's nothing that you can do but what God can forgive you. Now, I'm not asking you to do this, but I'm going to say this. Think of the most hideous sin that you could possibly imagine. And I want you to know that our Lord Jesus Christ can forgive that sin. I don't know about you. I haven't committed the most hideous sin in the world. I don't even know what the most hideous sin in the world is. But since he can forgive the most hideous of sins, everything I've done, surely he can forgive. He offers salvation and forgiveness of sin and remission of sin to whosoever will. God is not a prejudice God. Whoever comes to him, he will in no wise cast away. That's what makes judgment so awesome is the fact that we can all stand before God with the right place, with the right frame of mind, in the right condition. Can I have an amen? Wherefore I send you all manner, if I say all manner, of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And so the Lord reminds us that this world that we live in is not the only world that we're going to live in. That's awesome. What's this? Whosoever speaks against the man shall not be forgiven him, but whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Neither in this world, neither the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Amen. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasures, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof. And here's the word I'm looking for. In the day of judgment. Now, you might say, I don't need forgiveness. You have more control over your tongue than I do then. Because I'm going to tell you, every once in a while, I make a slip. And a lot of times, I'm not even aware I'm making a slip. And that's how much I know. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. That's why I know that I'm always in need of repentance. I want to live a repentant lifestyle. It wouldn't bother me if I said, Lord, forgive me 50 times a day. I want him to know that I, I, I acknowledge him. Can I have an amen? Listen to this. That we give and shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now, Jesus gave us a solemn warning about the fact of, of the day of judgment. Now, look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, watch this now, the men of Nineveh. Anybody know who Nineveh was? 
It was that city that God told Jonah, cry against. I'm going to destroy Nineveh. And, and, and they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And God spared that city from judgment for 256 more years. Amen. But the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. And shall condemn it. Because they, Nineveh, repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. And men did not repent when Jesus came. Amen. I don't want to stand in judgment. Besides a, but beside a Ninevite. And the Lord going to say, I'm glad you're here, Ninevite. Go to heaven. Who are you? I'm Pastor Cornwell. I lived in 2009. Oh, yeah, I know you. Y'all didn't repent when you should. Now you understand why I want to repent all the time. Amen. Amen. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came, the queen of Sheba, came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here and we won't ride in an air conditioned car to the house of God look at Mark look at Mark chapter 6 and verse 10 amen he said unto them in what place soever you enter into a house there abide till you depart from that place and then verse 11, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when you depart, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Again, I'm only trying to establish the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ himself continuously and repeatedly warned us about the day of judgment. Amen. Look at John chapter 5 and verse 21. For the, as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. In other words, when we stand before the Almighty God, we're going to be looking into the face of our Lord Jesus Christ because He is the one that made a way for all of us to be saved. And we're going to be judged by Him who walked on this earth and committed no sin. So if you think you're going to get there by your goodness, you ought to compare your life today by the life of Christ and see how far below him you fall. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they shall hear, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice who in the grave is going to hear his voice all that are in the grave rich and poor bond and free Christian and Muslim Buddhist and Hare Krishnas, 
atheists, agnostics, educated, uneducated, male, female, young and old. The Bible says all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Every man, woman, boy and girl that has ever lived on the face of this earth is going to come out of that grave. And they're going to be judged by the Son of God. I can't of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. Can I have an amen? Now, the great Apostle Paul, writer of over half of the New Testament, had these words to say in the book of Romans chapter 2. And again, I'm only trying to establish that in the New Testament, in the beginning, they believed in that great day of judgment. All right? Romans 2 and verse number 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now let me just, let me just share a little bit with you. Uh, I get applications all the time or referrals. People come and say, uh, so-and-so used your name as a reference. Now sometimes they call and say, can I use your name as a reference? And I always say yes, if you want me to tell the truth. Now, do you want me to tell the truth or do you want me to lie? Hallelujah. Don't ever apply for a retail job and you don't pay your tithe and you use me as a reference. Because I'm going to say, well, he's a thief, but outside of that, he's a good worker. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. How did I get off on that one? <laughs> Praise God. Uh, the Bible says that the pastor is going to present his flock to God. Now, I may lie down here and tell you that, tell your future employer that you're a good guy and you work hard and you don't slough off and, and, and he'll give you a full day's work for a full day's pay and, and he's honest, blah, blah, blah. And, and I, since you're going to pay your tithe, I'm going to make you look real good. I'm not going to tell him that, about the fact that you've been committing adultery and you lie and you steal and you got a pornographic magazine in your hip pocket and a beer can in your right hand. I'm not going to tell him all those things. But you know what? I got a feeling that when I stand before God in this congregation and pass it forth, that God is going to require me to give an account of everybody exactly like it is. It's a scary thought. Amen. That's why Hebrews chapter 13 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your soul as they that must give an account to God, that they might do it with joy and not with grief. Now you say, well, that's scary for us. It's not near as scary for you as it is for me. That is a frightening proposition that God is going to require me to give an account for every one of you. Wow. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. In other words, he's reaffirming the fact just like Jesus said, that there's coming a day of judgment. Verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. That's why I've been preaching lately. The more God is good to you, the more we ought to be praisers of God. 
But it seems like in this hour, it's just the opposite. The more God gives us, the more pride we get, and the less we worship God. When it ought to be just the opposite. The more God blesses you, the more we ought to open our mouth and give Him the praise. And lest you think you're doing all this yourself. Remember, all God's got to do is touch one tiny capillary in the back of your head, right back here. And you'd hit the sidewalk and be dead before the ambulance can get there. There was a man walking down Canal Street in New Orleans a few years ago. Young man, about 35 years old. And he slumped over, and uh, they called EMS, and they came. There was no apparent reason for him dying. He didn't have any diseases. He wasn't bruised and battered. And only when they'd done the autopsy did they find that that little tiny capillary in the back of his brain burst. We live by a thread. And for man to be so proud to think that he does everything as if though he gave his own self intelligence, that he gave his own self a body without disease, that he gave his own self everything that he needed, is utterly ridiculous. Because God is the author and the finisher of us all. Amen. Verse number five. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, that means a heart that doesn't repent, treasures up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now, when I got to studying this and and digging all this out, I could stand right here and quote scriptures and read scriptures all night long about the words of Christ, about the words of the Apostle Paul, about the words of Simon Peter, about the words of James, about every writer in the New Testament. And, and I got to look at it in the Old Testament, nearly every writer in the Old Testament spoke of the judgment coming. And it seemed like that if they all agree that there's coming a day of judgment, it ought to be a fact that we know there is going to be a day of reconciliation. Now, let me ask a second question. Why will we be judged? Who does God think he is to take us to judgment? Well, let's go a little bit further. Genesis 2.17. Now, we all, I use the word we and I use the word all, we all have a sin problem. Anybody agree with that? How about you? Do you have a sin problem? That's right. I'm talking about you on the video camera that's watching this DVD. Do you have a sin problem? Now, you can say no or shake your head, and I can't see you, but God does. I have a sin problem. I've had one since I was born. I inherited it from my mother. Well, actually, it was my father. Actually, it was my grandpa. Actually, it was before him. Watch this. Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That was the commandment of God in the Garden of Eden. All the trees you may eat of it, but there's one that I don't want you to eat of. And then I guess the Lord thought he was going to be tough. For in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And Adam and Eve's eyes got that big around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they didn't have a clue as to what he was talking about. Because how... Can you have remorse about dying 
when no one has ever died before. They didn't have any comprehension whatsoever. Amen. But we do know that they sampled the fruit. Can I have an amen? And we do know that they sinned. And that sin passed upon the human race. Look at Romans 5 and verse 12. Romans 5 and verse number 12. For where, wherefore... As by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that you have sinned. Is that what it says? No, it says all have sinned. Amen. And Romans 3.23, back up just a little bit. The scripture teaches a very... Clearly, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Preacher was preaching one night, and he said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I need y'all to pray that y'all help my fallen shorts. <laughs> Amen. It'll come in a minute. <laughs> okay, let's look at it. Let's look at the Old Testament for just a moment and see what Ezekiel had to say about it. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse number 20. Ezekiel 18 and verse number 20. The soul that sinneth, what does it say? It shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wickedness shall be upon him. But if the wicked shall turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, and he shall not die. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean a man can change the way he's living? That's exactly what God is saying. That God requires of every man to take note of how he's living and by the grace and help of God change the way he's living. How do you do that? By repenting. All right? All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. Oh, praise God. I... When I stand before God, it's going to be my luck that my mother's going to be right behind me. <laughs> and I did so many things that my mother never knew about. And I know that God knows all about them. And I hope I've repented for all those things because I don't want my mother to know what I did. <laughs> and I think you're the same way. But the Lord said it will not be mentioned. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Is God going around wanting to kill all the wicked people? He died for the wicked man. God, I feel the Holy Spirit here. Saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live, but when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. Now it's talking about if a man backslides and turns away from his righteousness, that his righteousness that he's already done, God's never going to mention that. In his trespass that he had trespassed, and in his sin that he has sinned, in them shall he die. You don't want to backslide in this hour. You don't want to be wicked in this hour. Because you can give a billion dollars, and you can do all kinds of good things. You can help little old ladies across the street. You can sell Girl Scout cookies. 
You can do anything you want to do. But if you're wicked, God is not even going to mention all the good things that you've done. He's going to judge you because you're wicked. You know what that's saying? And I like this. You can't buy God. You cannot buy God with your goodness. Amen. Now, it's made very clear that we're all in need of a Savior. That, now let me ask you a question. Isn't that the whole story of the Bible? That's God's redemption. If we could save ourselves, we would need a God. We would need a Savior. But I know of no one that can save himself. Amen. Now, that is the story of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He came, notice now, he came to bear our judgment. This is it. Folks, when I got to studying this out, and putting this lesson together, I had me a Holy Ghost fit. Because he came, Jesus Christ came to bear my judgment. I know how evil I am. I know how wrong I was. I know what I'm made of. I know what you're made of. There's none righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he came to bear my judgment. Now, I'm going to give you the greatest scripture. And if you want a passage to commit to memory, Isaiah 53. Turn there with me. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. I love this portion of scripture. I read probably as much as any other passage in the Bible. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Jesus hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. God did not make his attributes Charles Atlas. He did not make his, his attributes a Rock Hudson. He did not make his attributes uh, 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 the Travaltos or, or anybody else, the John Waynes. There is no beauty that any should desire him because of his humanly beauty. Let me tell you something. You cannot make a church beautiful enough to save somebody. For a fact, the church I got saved in was a, a, a wood frame building with, with uh, artificial brick siding and a wooden floor that didn't have any floor covering on it, a little uh, a platform about that high with ceramic sockets in the ceiling with light bulbs in them, and that's the lights, and it didn't have any air conditioning, it had windows in it that opened up the windows in the summertime to try to let some cool air come in, and, and, and the, the people that filled that building, they were just simple people, and here I was, I was a big old college student. It, the, the building did not attract me. You know what attracted me? The Holy Spirit was dealing with my life. And I didn't go looking at the building. I didn't go looking at the singers. I didn't go looking at the people. I, tried, I went there to try to find Jesus. Amen. I didn't even know that Jesus was a half Jew. Somebody just said he could save me. And I went looking for salvation. And when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, everything does not have to be just exactly right. Because when the Holy Spirit moves you and draws you, you're going you're gonna to find Jesus. Or, or should I say, he's going to find you. Amen. Well, I'm not going to get saved unless there's a billion dollar building and they've got a robe choir and they've got a pipe organ and they've got an educated priest. For fact, we have a man in our church. You would know him when I describe him. He's a farmer south of town down here. And uh, his wife had come to church and was living, started living for God. And his daughter came and got saved. And another daughter came and got saved. And the son-in-law came and got saved. And he was a mean mouth. 
Oh, and he hated preachers and he hated churches and he really hated me and he really hated this church. And uh, his wife made some appointments and came and got counseling from me and, and, and he said, why don't you ask him what kind of credentials he has? All he is is an ignorant Pentecostal preacher. And I, his wife said, before we start this counseling session, uh, could you show me your credentials? And she didn't know any better. I said, uh, what kind of credentials would you like? I said, I have, I've got 42 years of experience in counseling with people. And I said, if you're wondering if I got a degree, I have a BS degree in chemical engineering from Louisiana Tech University. I have 45 hours above a BS degree in biomedical engineering and nuclear technology. What else would you like to know? She said, you got all that? I said, yes, ma'am. I said, you thought I was a dumb preacher, didn't you? She said, what, 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 what? Uh, uh. She said, my, my husband thought she was. I said, you go tell that old skin flint that I'm more educated than he ever thought about being. <laughs> and you know what? One day, God got a hold of his heart. And he was way up the country. And he called me. And he was just a-weeping. Brother Cornwell, please forgive me. I've said evil things about you. I've said bad things about the church. But my God, he's getting a hold of my heart. There's something wrong. I've got to get right with God. Would you forgive me? You know what? It didn't matter what the church looked like. It didn't matter what you looked like. When the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your heart, all you want to do is find Jesus. Can I have an amen? Now, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord uh, revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And when he hung on that cross, remember this. They had taken blacksmith's tongs and ripped his beard out. They had beat him with a cat of nine tails. A cat of nine tails was a little a handle, had nine pieces of leather going off of it. They had r ribbed in, in that leather pieces of bone and glass and lead. And they stripped him and they beat him 39 times with that, that cat of nine tails. He was the bloodiest man you've ever seen. And then they took a spear and they pierced the side and blood and water gushed out. They had put a crown of thorns, honey locust thorns, on his head. They took a rod about four foot long, about three quarters of an inch in diameter, and they beat those, that, that crown of thorns into his skull. And he had never had poison in his body before. And when that poison came into his bloodstream, his face turned completely black and, 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 and bruised. And it expanded almost twice normal size. You think there was any beauty in Jesus Christ when he hung on that cross? There was no beauty that anybody would desire him. But it wasn't his beauty that saved us. You know what saved us? His blood saved us. Why? He went to judgment for us. He is despised and rejected of men. Excuse me, I'm, I'm kind of emotional right now. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. He wasn't killed by man. He was killed by God to fulfill the scripture that I've already read to you in Genesis. He became judgment for you and I. He was wounded. For our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us. Every sin that we have ever committed was laid upon his door. 
He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is done, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord. Listen to this. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Praise God. Amen. When I think of why there's going to be a judgment. Amen. Look at, look at one more passage. The Lord has always had a way for man to be saved. It was always his way, never our way. Amen. For Adam and Eve, it was a lamb. For Noah, it was an ark. For the children of Israel, it was the law. And for the world, a cross. This is so emotional tonight. I'm going to do my best to teach this with dry eyes. John 3 and verse 14. The song says, On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Amen. John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth uh, not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light is come in the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, let his, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds might be made manifest, there, that they are wrought in God. Amen. Now, if you want to know why there's going to be judgment, because all have sinned. We're going to give an account. Now, let me ask the third question. When will we be judged? This is very important. This is a very important person. A question, excuse me. There are actually three places in which we may find ourselves. Three places. Not two, but three. Personally, I choose the first one. Now, 1 Peter 4.17. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. This is important. Now, for you that think that the house of God is unimportant to your life, Maybe you should read this text. Amen. For the time has come that judgment must begin at our house. Is that what it says? That maybe judgment must begin at the movie theater. 
our judgment must begin at the beard joint. So what it says, what does it say? That judgment must begin at the house of God. That's not my words. This tells us how important that the house of God is. That the assembling of the body of Christ, what's this? And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely or barely <laughs> be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Judgment always begins in the house of God. Always. Now, it is the house of God that we learn that we're sinners. Don't you just hate it when that old long-armed, bony-fingered preacher gets to preaching and he talks about sin and you think he's preaching to you. And you know why you think that? Because he is. <laughs> Hallelujah. My pastor, years ago, he was a wise old man. He said, son, if you want to pastor a long time, figure out what the people are doing wrong and preach against something else. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've often wondered why some of the worst preachers I've ever seen have large congregations. It's because they never preach against what the people are doing. And I had, I hadn't got no sense to know better, and I just wade into you, praise God. <laughs> Close your eyes and, and just take the book and just praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. When I go to the house of God, I want a preacher to talk to me about where I'm living. I want him to remind me of my sins because it gives me an opportunity to be judged at the house of God. Amen. Now, look at Acts 2, and verse 37. What does it mean that judgment must begin at the house of God? Do you know when the Holy Spirit convicts you and you, you feel this tugging and this drawing, you go to the house of God, you don't even remember what the preacher preached. You don't remember the singing or the singers. You sit there and all you can remember is the presence of God coming to you. And all of a sudden the preacher gives an invitation or the altar call. And you stand up, and you're scared, and you're apprehensive, and you turn to walk out the door and to get out of that place. Instead of turning right to go to the door, you turn left, and you find yourself standing at the altar. And you, all of a sudden, people start gathering around you. They start praying with you. And you, you find yourself lifting your hands. And you start saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me, Lord. I've done so much wrong. You know where you're at? You're standing in the presence of judgment. And when you repent, it's like dying. That's why the Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. And, and, and then... All of a sudden, Acts 2, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Repent. Die. And be baptized, buried, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You're standing in judgment. God, when you acknowledge you're a sinner, you're standing in the place of judgment. And when you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, He washes all of your sin and your condemnation away. 
The Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Can I have an amen? For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection in Romans chapter 6. And we literally rise to walk in the newness of life. You know why? Because we have gone to our day of judgment. That is the judgment I want to go to. At the house of God. At the altar of prayer. My sins are washed away. My sins are forgiven. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Amen. The problem is our world has skipped that judgment. Amen. He said, for the promises unto you, verse 39, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The Holy Spirit is calling you. If you're a mother or a father and you have children, do you know the chances of your children ever hearing the truth and the full gospel of Jesus Christ is little to none unless you lead them to church? I had a man tell me one day, he said, I don't want you teaching my kid nothing about God. I said, why? He said, well, I don't want them to learn anything until they turn 18, and then they can decide for themselves. I said, sir, by the time they're 18, the devil will have already done his work. I want my children to know about God from the time they're this high. I want my children raised so that they know right from wrong. And if you think the world's going to teach them right from wrong, you're wrong. If you think the schools are going to teach your kids right from wrong, you're wrong. If you think the drug addicts and the pimps and the pushers and all the other junk in our world is going to teach your kids right from wrong, you're wrong. You better hope and pray that you find a godly church and a godly preacher that has guts, gall, grits, and grace to stand and preach the truth and not tiptoe through the tithers. Amen. Verse 40, and with many other words he testified and exhorted, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there was added to them 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Can I have an amen? Now, when the convicted spirit of the Holy Ghost moves us to be saved, it's like standing in judgment. And God will judge you before you die. He will pour his blood out upon you. When you're baptized in the name of Jesus, you cannot separate the name of Jesus from the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is applied to your life. And you're forgiven. And your sins are washed away. Amen. Now, there are two thrones of judgment. The judgment seat of Christ and the white throne of judgment. The judgment seat of Christ in the Bible is called the Christian's throne. The white throne of judgment is the sinner's throne. Now, if you wake up one day and you see this big white throne and the hordes of people rushing to it, if you possibly can, turn around and run the other way. <laughs> because you're a sinner, and you're headed to the sinner's throne. Amen. Now, will we, let's talk about the judgment seat of Christ for a moment. Does anybody know what a marathon is? In the, in the old days of the Greek Empire, they had the marathon. And when the man won the marathon, he went before the king to receive his reward for winning. And uh, it was called the Bema. He approached the Bema or the judgment seat. 
And there the wreath was tied around his neck. And he received his reward for the deed well done. That's where I want to go. I want the victor's crown. I've repented of my sins. I've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. I, I have tried to do my best to live for God. And the minute I die, I'm going straight to the judgment seat of Christ and I'm going to receive my victor's crown. Amen. 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 Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And watch this. Therefore, we're always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. In other words, as long as you're alive, you can't see him. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We're confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body. Remember last week's lesson? When, a, when physical death, the body is separated from the soul. And to be present with the Lord. Wherever we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted Him. For we must all, Christians, let's talk to Christians now. We must all appear before the judgment seat or the bema of Christ. That every man may receive the things done in this body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We're going to receive our rewards. Amen. Did you know that there's going to be people, normal, ordinary, common people, that are going to be so weighted down with their rewards, they're going to have to hire people to carry all their rewards. And you know there's going to be a lot of preachers go there, and they're going to get one little tiny crown. And they, well, you'll be able to see mine because I ain't got no hair. Amen. I'm not going to get a great reward because I can speak. I'm not going to have a great reward because I'm the pastor. If I get a reward, it's going to be because of the things I've done in my life. Can I have an amen? So you want, you want to go to the, the judgment seat of Christ. You, you want, you, I'm looking forward to that because as soon as we get to the Bema and we're going to receive our rewards, guess where we're going? We're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know what they're going to have at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Crawfish etouffee and Dr. Pepper. I'm picking, hallelujah. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Amen. Now, what about the second throne? The second throne. The white throne of judgment. This is the sinner's throne. When time shall be no more, when the rapture is behind us, the tribulation is past. The thousand years of peace is over. All that are in the grave is going to hear his voice. All that are in the grave is going to hear his voice. Somebody said, why do we have to wait so long to be judged as a sinner? You take the little squirts, I mean demons, I mean little pimps that run around our city. And they sell your 12-year-old child crack cocaine. And your child smokes that crack cocaine. And he becomes a drug addict. And then he robs 14 banks and 15 quick trips. To satisfy his habit. And he sells drugs. To support his habit. And he addicts 50 more kids. And those 50 kids addict another 150 more kids. You can't be judged. For selling that one kid rock cocaine. Until all of the evil that that has caused is finished. Because when you stand before God. The books are going to be opened. You're not just responsible for your sin, 
but you're responsible for the evil that you have passed on to everybody else. And you can't receive the righteous judgment of God until your sin has finally played itself out. And that's only after time has ceased and time shall be no more. When you stand before the white throne of judgment, the books are going to be open. It's going to be almost like a movie screen. God's going to show you every sin that you've committed, that you've caused others to commit. He's going to let you see the carnage and the wreckage and the ruin of people's lives that what you did actually caused them to do what they did. To me, that is so scary. That is so scary. That's why I want to go to the altar and I want to be smeared with the blood of Jesus. Some men are going to die here in repentance. And when they get to the Lord, their sins will have gone before them and the Lord's going to take care of them by his blood. But some men are going to die and stand before God and their sins are going to follow them to the throne. I want to send my sins ahead. I want Jesus to take care of those sins before I get there. I don't want, to follow, I don't want my sin walking up behind me in the day of judgment. Look at Revelation chapter 20, and this is how he reads it, okay? How he writes it. Verse 7. When the thousand years were expired, the rapture has taken place, the tribulation is over, the thousand years of peace are behind, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He shall go out to see the nations which are in the four quarters of their Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from the God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. You're not just going to burn up. You're going to be cast into a lake of fire and you're going to be tormented night and day forever and forever. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, that's body and soul, Remember last week, our last lesson? If you don't, are confused, go back to lesson 17. And hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. When you come out of that, God's going to bring you out of hell where your soul is. He's going to bring your body out of the grave. Your body and soul are going to be reunited. You're going to stand before God. And God's going to show you why that you went to hell. You refuse the blood of Jesus. You refuse the mercy of God. You had to do it your way. Amen. The sea gave up the dead which were in the death, that's the body, and hell, that's the soul. They lived up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell, that's body and soul, were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is a scary lesson. This, this lesson preachers try to avoid in the pulpit. Preachers like to talk about the blessings of God. We like to talk about the goodness of God. But we know the goodness and the severity of God. Amen. The Lord will not force anyone to be saved. He will not force you. He is a gentleman. His spirit is gentle. He is not like 
the Muslim God. But they force you to be saved at the end of a gun barrel with violence. God does not save people with violence. He does not put a gun to your head. He does not walk around with machetes slaughtering people that don't get saved. I resent any religion that tries to force you to be saved. John 6, 44, No man comes to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. The Lord is in the drawing business. John 6, 55, 6, 65, He said, Therefore said I unto you, no man can come unto me except it was given unto him by my Father. And then one last verse tonight before I quit. John 12, 31. Now, now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth. This is speaking of how Jesus would die. I will draw all men. To me. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Let us bow our heads. Father, I have taught one of the most serious lessons that I have ever taught in my life. For me, Lord, this has been a very emotional hour. I thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And I pray in the name of Jesus that every man, woman, and boy and girl that listens to this lesson tonight could be moved by the Holy Spirit. Even as they feel the tugging presence of God drawing them. I ask you to forgive them of their sins. I ask you, Lord, to save their family. And I pray for them. Holy Spirit, we know that Jesus is coming back very soon. And I ask you in the name of Jesus to save our city and to save our nation in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone said amen. amen. God bless you. Let's just